Hi everybody, it's Shannon again here on No Shelf Control. I am back with 11 more books that came out last week that I can't wait to share with you. We went through 11 yesterday that came out on either March 28th or April 4th. And when I realized I had 11 more from April 4th, I decided that I should go ahead and split it up into two days. I didn't think you wanted to listen to 22 books in one video. So that's what today is about. Today is about those additional 11 books that I'm excited about that came out on April 4th and that I want to share with you. So let's talk about the first one. The first one is called Never Vacation with Your Ex. It's by Emily Wibberley and Austin Sigmund Broca. And it says, Sun, Sand, Second Chances. This is a romance, of course. And it says, Forgetting Sarah Marshall meets Crazy Stupid Love in a YA second chance romance from fan favorite author couple, hashtag Wibroka. 17-year-old volleyball star Kaylee Jordan lives a life of player rankings, constant training, and a carefully curated social media full of followers watching to see if she'll go pro out of high school, like her famous mom. Her one refuge and the thing she looks forward to every summer? The vacation her family spends in Malibu with the Freeman Hughes. This year, there's only one problem. Kaylee and their son, Dean, dated for the past three months, and Kaylee just unceremoniously dumped him. Hoping to spare them the worst summer ever, Kaylee comes to Dean with her unconventional solution. She's going to walk him through her rules for getting over an ex. When Dean grudgingly cooperates, Kaylee's got her work cut out for her. But helping Dean follow her own rules starts becoming difficult when the pressures of Kaylee's family legacy and perfect life start to feel less like a plan and more like a prison. And amid warm California nights and stolen laughs, Kaylee feels herself falling for Dean for the same reasons and some new ones. With their trip coming to an end, Kaylee has to make the complicated choice be between doing what's expected and taking a second chance on love. So, I have never heard of Emily Wibberley and Austin, Austin Sigmund Broca, and I did not know that they were called hashtag Wibroca, but apparently they are famous and popular in the YA romance category. I just thought it was an interesting premise, um, a brand new book coming out. Um, I love the idea that this young woman is an athlete and that she is... Um, fighting her way through social media fame and all of those kinds of pressures that would come with being a high school athlete at the top of your game. And then that she has this love interest that she's trying to coach into how to get over her. Um, and then what happens, you know, as they work through that. So thought it was an interesting premise, an interesting romance. I'm trying to explore more romance. Um, and this is a good one. So it says, Forgetting Sarah Marshall Meets Crazy Stupid Love. Those are two that I really loved, so I'm hoping it's going to be a good book. You know, I think I forgot to go over the details of that book. It came out April 4th, Viking Books for Young Readers, and it's 336 pages. So our next one up is edited by Lauren Gabaldi and Eric Smith, and it is called First Year Orientation. Uh, it is 336 pages by Candlewick Press, and it came out last week as well. Now, this is a book of stories. I'm excited about that. So, it says 16 acclaimed authors, including a National Book Award nominee, a New York Times bestselling novelist, and a beloved actress, join forces for a cross-genre YA anthology of linked short stories about the first days of college. Jilly cannot believe her parents keep showing up at all of her orientation events, except, yes, she can totally believe that. Isaac wants to be known as someone other than the kid who does magic and has an emotional support bunny. Lily is stuck working at the college bookstore during orientation, but maybe new friends are closer than they appear. Hyra, meanwhile, just wants to retire from ghost hunting once and for all, but a spirit in the library's romance section has other ideas. For their sophomore effort, the contributing editors behind the critically acclaimed Battle of the Bands admit us to opening day at a fictional college with a collection that makes an ideal high school graduation gift or summer before read. This colorful array of stories spans genres and moods from humorous to heartfelt to ghostly, tackling with sensitivity, humor, and warmth what it feels like to take those first shaky steps into adulthood. And the stories are by... 
Adi Alsed, Anna Birch, Brian Bliss, Gloria Chow, Jennifer Chin, Olivia Cole, Dana Davis, Christina Forrest, Lauren Gabaldi, Kathleen Glasgow, Sam Mags, Farinaz Rishi, Lance Rubin, Amina May Safi, Eric Smith, and Phil Stamper. And you will probably remember that Amina May Safi was one of the judges from the Tournament of Books. So that is one name that should uh, pop out there for you. I'm excited about this because it's stories. I love books of stories and they're intertwined stories by different authors. So I really am excited about that. And it's also about college. I have a soft spot for college stories. Um, my college years were probably the best of my life. And so if you can set something on a college campus for me, I'm all in. Uh, ditto a boarding school. <laughs> Anything like that is, is right up my alley. So I hope you will check that one out. It's called First Year Orientation and the editors are Lauren Gabaldi and Eric Smith. The next one on my list is An Appetite for Miracles and it is written by Lakin Zia Kemp. Um, and it says that he or she, I don't know if Lakin Zia Kemp is a man or a woman, is the author of Pura Belpri Anna book, Somewhere Between Bitter and Sweet. The Pura Belpri Honor book. Somewhere between bitter and sweet. Okay, so this book came out April 4th, Little Brown Books for Young Readers, and it's 448 pages. So this is a, a bigger book for YA. It says, award-winning author Lakin Zia Kemp's heart-wrenching novel in verse follows two teens who must come together to heal the pain from their pasts. Perfect for fans of Elizabeth Acevedo and Nicola Yoon. Dana Mendoza Villarreal's grandfather is slowly losing himself as his memories fade, and Dana's not sure her plan to help him remember through the foods he once reviewed will be enough to bring him back, especially when her own love of food makes her complicated relationship with her mother even more difficult. Raul Santos has been lost ever since his mother was wrongly incarcerated two years ago. Playing guitar for the elderly has been his only escape to help them remember and him forget. But when his mom unexpectedly comes back into his life, what is he supposed to do when she isn't the same person who left? When Dana and Raul meet, sparks fly immediately, and they embark on a mission to heal her grandfather and themselves, because healing is something best done together, even if it doesn't always look the way we want it to. So I think this one might be sweet. Um, I love Elizabeth Acevedo. I've read a couple of her books. I don't think I've read anything by Nicola Yoon, but that's the second time she's been mentioned as a like books by Nicola Yoon for other books that I'm interested in. So I'm curious about that. Um, we have some Alzheimer's in my family, some dementia going on right now. So um, this topic is close to home and um, I'm interested to see what Dana Mendoza Villa Real does with food to try and bring uh, her grandfather's memories back. It sounds, um, it sounds realistic to me. I think food is so important and so visceral that I wonder, um, you know, how it's going to be used in this story in this context. So, that is an appetite for miracles by Lake and Zia Kemp. The next one, and I guess I have a lot of YA in a row here. I'm not sure how that happened, but. If you're into YA, you're in good hands. Um, I like YA. I think there are a lot of really good YA books. Um, and if you're not into YA, take a chance. Pick one of these and see which one might be interesting to you. Um, I think you'll be surprised. They're a little more generally heartfelt than adult books. Um, usually a little shorter, a little faster read, but sometimes just as powerful and amazing as some of the adult books that I read. So. This one is called I Mija by Christine Suggs. Um, and it says, my bilingual summer in Mexico. And it, the blurb says, an absolutely heartwarming and vibrant story of belonging, family, and the meaning of home. This book is a treasure. And that blurb is by Julie Murphy, New York Times bestselling author of Dumplin', which I loved. If you haven't read Dumplin', check it out. It's got Dolly Parton in it. Okay. Uh, I Mija is a graphic novel um, as you've heard, I've been trying to dip my toe into the graphic novel Waters. I did buy Mouse at the uh, bookstore that I visited last weekend, so I have that now and I'm working my way slowly through it. Um, but you guys saw me start with um, The Magic Fish that I got two bookstores ago. Um, and I don't know, the graphic novels are appealing to me. 
So I, Miha, a graphic novel came out April 4th, Little Brown Ink Bilingual, and it's 336 pages. Here we go. Let's see. It talks about the blurb first, so I'm going to skip that. In this bilingual, inventive, and heartfelt debut, graphic novel talent Christine Suggs explores a trip they took to Mexico to visit family, embracing and rebelling against their heritage and finding a sense of belonging. 16-year-old Christine takes their first solo trip to Mexico to spend a few weeks with their grandparents and Tia. At first, Christine struggles to connect with family they don't yet share a language with. Seeing the places their mom grew up, the school she went to, the cafe where she had her first date with their father, Christine becomes more and more aware of the generational differences in their family. Soon, Christine settles into life in Mexico, eating pan dulce, drawing what they see, and growing more comfortable with Spanish. But when mom joins their trip, Christine's two worlds collide. They feel homesick for Texas, struggle against traditions, and miss being able to speak to their mom without translating. Eventually, through exploring the impacts of colonialism in both Mexico and themselves, they find their place in their family and start to feel comfortable with their mixed identity. So I love a good book about identity. Um, this is obviously, it appears to be based in reality. The main character's name is Christine, um, uses they, them pronouns, and Christine Suggs is the author. So I am assuming that there is something to that. Um, so it would also be uh, queer literature, which I'm down for. And then um, interested to see what the, you know, bilingual identity is like, what it's like to, I, you know, I lived in Japan. And so I know what it's like to live someplace where you can't communicate readily at first, um, you know, and, and her being there with family and not being able to communicate strongly in Spanish has got to be difficult. So um I just thought this one sounded really interesting. It's a graphic novel, something I want to do more of. So check it out if you have any interest in graphic novels. They're generally pretty quick reads, and so I recommend that. Let's move on to something besides YA. This next one is nonfiction. So this is by Timothy Egan, and it's called A Fever in the Heartland, The Ku Klux Klan's Plot to Take Over America and the Woman Who Stopped Them. It says it's from the National Book Award winning and New York Times bestselling author, Timothy Egan. Uh, came out last week by Viking, published by Viking, and it's 432 pages. Here we go. With meticulous detective work, Timothy Egan shines a light on one of the most sinister chapters in American history, how a viciously racist movement led by a murderous con man rose to power in the early 20th century. A Fever in the Heartland is compelling, powerful, and profoundly resonant today. And that quote is from David Gran, author of The Wager and Killers of the Flower Moon. And here's what it says about the book. A historical thriller by the Pulitzer and National Book Award winning author that tells the riveting story of the Klan's rise to power in the 1920s, the cunning con man who drove that rise, and the woman who stopped them. The Roaring Twenties, the Jazz Age, has been characterized as a time of Gatsby frivolity, but it was also the height of the uniquely American hate group, the Ku Klux Klan. Their domain was not the old Confederacy, but the heartland and the West. They hated Blacks, Jews, Catholics, and immigrants in equal measure, and took radical steps to keep those people from the American promise. And the man who set in motion their takeover of great swaths of America, was a charismatic charlatan named D.C. Stevenson. Stevenson was a magnetic presence whose life story changed with every telling. Within two years of his arrival in Indiana, he'd become the grand dragon of the state and the architect of the strategy that brought the group out of the shadows. Their message endorsed from the pulpits of local churches, spread at family picnics and town celebrations. Judges, prosecutors, ministers, governors, and senators across the country all proudly proclaimed their membership. But at the peak of his influence, it was a seemingly powerless woman, Madge Oberholzer, who would reveal his secret cruelties and whose deathbed testimony finally brought the Klan to their knees. A Fever in the Heartland marries a propulsive drama to a powerful and page-turning reckoning with one of the darkest threads in American history. So the topic is very interesting to me. I think it's very timely considering where we seem to be going in this country. Um, 
but I love propulsive nonfiction. So a narrative nonfiction that tells a story, um, I really can get behind. And this sounds like it is written in that way. Killers of the Flower Moon definitely was. And so if David Gran is endorsing this book, I'm hopeful that it will take on that kind of um, tone. So, um, you know, we still have white crosses on the highway in Ohio where I live. When I lived in North Carolina, you could call the KKK from the phone book. Um, you know, just crazy stuff that um, I can't believe still exists in this country, but um, it does. And I'm curious to read the history and see, you know, interestingly, the um, synopsis is written as if the KKK doesn't exist anymore. I don't think that's true. Um, they may not be as out in the open as they once were, but I think they still exist. So um, I'll be interested to read this history and to read about Madge Oberholzer, who uh, brought them down. So, okay, how about another work of nonfiction? This one is called Welcome to the Circus of Baseball by Ryan McGee, a story of the perfect summer at the perfect ballpark at the perfect time came out last week by Doubleday, and it's 272 pages. Here's what we know about Welcome to the Circus of Baseball. A gloriously funny, nostalgic memoir of a popular ESPN reporter who in the summer of 1994 was a fresh out of college intern for a minor league baseball team. Madness and charm ensue as Ryan McGee spends the season steeped in sweat, fertilizer, nacho cheese sauce, and pure unadulterated joy in North Carolina with, with the Asheville tourists. A sweet and funny book that reminds us it's not just the game itself that draws us, it's also the people. Tom Verducci, Major League Baseball Network, Fox and Sports Illustrated, and New York Times bestselling author of The Yankee Years. In the spring of 1994, Ryan McGee, new college graduate, bombed his coveted interview with ESPN, the only place he ever wanted to work. But he did receive one job offer, to work for $100 a week for the Asheville Tourists, a proud minor league baseball team in the heart of North Carolina's Blue Ridge Mountains. McCormick Field, home to the Tourists, had once been graced by Ty Cobb, Lou Gehrig, Babe Ruth, and Jackie Robinson. What could go wrong? Welcome to the Circus of Baseball is McGee's hilarious, charming memoir of his first summer working in the sporting world. He has since risen the ESPN ranks to national TV, radio, and internet host but his time in Asheville still looms large. Among the many jewels of his experience, McGee recounts one of the most entertaining on-field brawls you'll ever witness between the 14 league mascots who had assembled for the All-Star Game, an eight foot tall foam costumed crustacean, a pudgy red fox, a giant skunk, and they were really fighting. As well as the nervous moment he oversaw the game day entertainer known as Captain Dynamite and his exploding coffin of death. Most important, McGee details a magical summer of baseball, of learning the ropes, of the ins and outs of running a minor league team, and of coming to understand how the pulse of a community can beat gloriously through a minor league ball club. Welcome to the Circus of Baseball is a baseball classic in the making. Now I come from a baseball family. My brother played through college, followed baseball teams all over the place when I was growing up. Um, and still love baseball. Um, had the uh, minor league team when I lived in North Carolina was the Durham Bulls, and now we have the Columbus Clippers here where I live. Um, so also love going to a good minor league game and just think that this book is going to be charming and insightful. Um, I think it would be a great uh, potential Father's Day gift if your dad is into baseball, if your mom is into baseball, maybe a potential Mother's Day gift, but um, just seems charming and like a story that I want to read. So I thought I would share that with you. Let's see, what's next? We have This Is Not Miami by Fernanda Melkor, and it's translated by Sophie Hughes. So the original title is Aqui No Es Miami, um, and it was published last week by New Directions, and it's a slim little volume, 160 pages. Here is This Is Not Miami. Set in and around the Mexican city of Veracruz, This Is Not Miami delivers a series of devastating stories spiraling from real events that bleed together reportage and the author's rich and rigorous imagination. These narrative nonfiction pieces probe deeply into the motivations of murderers and misfits, into their desires and circumstances, 
forcing us to understand them and even empathize, despite our wish to simply label them as monsters. As in her hugely acclaimed novels Hurricane Season and Paradise, Fernanda Melchor's masterful stories show how the violent and shocking aberrations that make the headlines are only the surface ruptures of a society on the brink of chaos. So Veracruz, Mexico, the um, crimes and other activities that take place there, the stories that we read in the headlines, and this is sort of both behind the scenes and a little bit fictionalized by Fernanda Melchor. Um, so I was really intrigued by this and it's called This Is Not Miami. Um, you know, I just think anytime a, a true life story can be explored a little bit in a way that's interesting. Um, I, you know, again, narrative nonfiction, it, I definitely have a soft spot for it. So that is This Is Not Miami by Fernanda Melkor. Let's see. Next, we have This Bird Has Flown by Susanna Hoffs. That is, of course, published last week, Little Brown and Company, 368 pages. This Bird Has Flown. And here's what we know about it. A delightfully funny and romantic debut novel from Susanna Hoffs, the celebrated performer and co-founder of The Bangles. Jane Start is 33, broke, and recently single. 10 years prior, she had a hit song written by world famous superstar Jonesy, but Jane hasn't had a breakout since. Now she's living out of four garbage bags at her parents' house, reduced to performing karaoke tracks in Las Vegas, rock bottom. But when her longtime manager Pippa sends Jane to London to regroup, she's seated next to an intriguing stranger on the flight, the other Tom Hardy, an elegantly handsome Oxford professor of literature. Jane is instantly smitten by Tom and soon truly inspired. But it's not Jane's past alone that haunts her second chance at stardom and at love. Is Tom all that he seems? And can Jane emerge from the shadow of Jonesy's earlier hit and into a light of her own? In turns, deeply sexy, riotously funny, and utterly joyful, This Bird Has Flown explores love, passion, and the ghost of our past, and offers a glimpse inside the music business that could only come from beloved songwriter Susanna Hoffs. So Susanna Hoffs from The Bangles, I love that. Um, you know, that's my generation. Um, also, another book about a woman of a certain age. You know, I think we've been getting more of those. Um, she's 33, which isn't that old, but it's closer to my age than books about 20 year olds. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm curious, I want to see what's behind the covers in the music world. Um, and I also want to find out um, what happens to this woman's life and, and see if there are any parallels to Susanna Hoff's life as well. Okay, so that was This Bird Has Flown by Susanna Hoffs. And then we have Carmen and Grace by Melissa Cos Aquino. Uh, William Morrow and Company, 400 pages. Carmen and Grace. An emotionally riveting coming of age drama, the story of two cousins lured into the underground drug trade at a young age and the inextricable ties that bind them as one woman seeks power and the other seeks a way out the debut of a vibrant and stunningly original new voice in fiction. Carmen and Grace have been inseparable since they were little girls, more like sisters than cousins, survivors of a childhood marked by neglect and addiction and a system that never valued them. For too long, all they had was each other. That is until Doña Durka swept into their lives and changed everything, taking Grace into her home, providing stability and support, and playing an outsized role in Carmen's upbringing too. Durka is more than a beneficent force in their Bronx neighborhood, though. She's also the leader of an underground drug empire, a larger-than-life matriarch who understands the vital importance of taking what power she can in a world too often ruled by violent men. So when Durka dies suddenly under mysterious circumstances, Carmen and Grace's lives are thrown into chaos. Grace has been primed to take over and has grand plans to expand the business. While Carmen is ready to move on from the shadow of Durka and her high expectations, and most of all, from always looking over her shoulder in fear. She's also harboring a secret. She's pregnant and starting to show and desperate to build a new life before the baby arrives. But how can Carmen leave the only family she's ever known, this tight sisterhood of women known as the DOD, a group of lost girls turned skilled professionals under Durka's guiding hand, 
all tightly bonded in their spirituality and merciless support for one another, especially now when outside threats are circling and Grace's plans are speeding reckless, recklessly forward. As tough and tender as its main characters, Carmen and Grace will grab readers from the first page with its raw beauty, depth of feeling, and heart-pounding plot. A moving meditation on the choices of women and the legacy of violence, it's a devastatingly wise and intimate story about the bonds of female friendship, ambition, and found family. So there's my code word, found family. I love a good book about found family. Um, but this just sounds amazing. Like it sounds riveting. I want to get to know these characters. I want to understand their situations. I want to see how it plays out. Um, and this is a debut. Melissa Cos Aquino is a debut author. So really, what's not to love here? I can't wait to tear into this one. Um, I'm so glad that it's already out and uh, just can't wait to get my hands on a copy. It is 400 pages, but they will be 400 pages well spent, I'm sure. Okay, let's see. Now we have A Living Remedy, a memoir by Nicole Chung. So again, we're back to nonfiction. The blurb on this one says, a groundbreaking narrative steeped in love, humor, the infinitude of memory, and the essentiality of community by Brian Washington, the author of Memorial. And this is by Nicole Chung, best-selling author of All You Can Ever Know. Uh, this is from Echo Press, 256 pages, and of course out on April 4th. So here's what we've got about A Living Remedy, a memoir. From the best-selling author of All You Can Ever Know comes a searing memoir of class, inequality, and grief, a daughter's search to understand the lives of her adoptive parents, the life she forged as an adult, and the lives she's lost. In this country, unless you attain extraordinary wealth, you will likely be unable to help your loved ones in all the ways you'd hoped. You will learn to live with the specific hollow guilt of those who leave hardship behind, yet are unable to bring anyone else with them. When Nicole Chung graduated from high school, she couldn't hightail it out of her overwhelmingly white Oregon hometown fast enough. As a scholarship student at a private university on the East Coast, no longer the only Korean she knew, she found a sense of community she had always craved as an Asian American adoptee and a path to the life she'd long wanted. But the middle class world she begins to raise a family in, where there are big homes, college funds, nice vacations, looks very different from the middle class world she thought she grew up in, where paychecks have to stretch to the end of the week, health insurance is often lacking, and there are no safety nets. When her father dies at only 67, killed by diabetes and kidney disease, Nicole feels deep grief as well as rage, knowing that years of financial instability and lack of access to health care contributed to his premature death. And then the unthinkable happens. Less than a year later, her beloved mother is diagnosed with cancer, and the physical distance between them becomes insurmountable as COVID descends upon the world. Exploring the enduring strength of family bonds in the face of hardship and tragedy, a living remedy examines what it takes to reconcile the distance between one life, one home, and another, and sheds needed light on some of the most persistent and tragic inequalities in American society. So this really speaks to what's going on in our country today with health insurance and health care and the differences between the haves and the have nots. Um, and this being a memoir, it really appeals to me. I, I want to see what Nicole Chung has to say. So um, I will be picking this one up as soon as I can uh, to check out A Living Remedy by Nicole Chung. I think the title is a little strange. I don't know what a living remedy means, and the cover itself, it looks like a string of rocks, but each rock has, like one's a rock, one has the ocean, one has trees, and then the next one is a rock. I don't really get it, but I'm curious about the book. So uh, the synopsis sounds great. Let's see. The last book on my list for today, number 11, is called Divine Rivals, a novel. And it says, no God, no creature, no war can come between them and it's by Rebecca Ross. It's published by Wednesday Books, 368 pages, and it of course came out last week. After centuries of sleep, the gods are warring again, but 18-year-old Iris Winnow just wants to hold her family together. Her mother is suffering from addiction and her brother is missing from the front lines. 
Her best bet is to win the columnist promotion at the Oath Gazette. To combat her worries, Iris writes letters to her brother and slips them beneath her wardrobe door, where they vanish into the hands of Roman Kit, her cold and handsome rival at the paper. When he anonymously writes Iris back, the two of them forge a connection that will follow Iris all the way to the front lines of battle for her brother, the fate of mankind, and love. When two young rival journalists find love through a magical connection, they must face the depths of hell in a war among gods to seal their fate forever. Shadow and Bone meets Lore in this epic enemies to lovers fantasy novel filled with hope and heartbreak and the unparalleled power of love. So this is fantasy. As you know, I sort of dance around fantasy. If something comes highly recommended to me, I'll read it. I shy away from it, but this sounds so good. Um, so it sounds real and realistic, but it also has sort of a fantasy twist. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that um, and really want to check that one out. So that is Divine Rivals by Rebecca Ross. And those are 11 more books that came out April 4th that you should check out. Now, I know you don't have time to read 22 books. I don't either. Um, but that is a list of great options um, that you could check out for your TBR and get your hands on. Reserve them from your library, go to Goodreads giveaways, request them from NetGalley, or simply buy them from bookshop.org and uh, benefit an indie bookstore today. So... Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing about all these books that I'm excited about. This, this is the end of the 22 for this week. We'll see how many I end up with for next week. Um, but I loved sharing this with you. If you enjoyed it, please click like and subscribe. Um, I can't wait to come back tomorrow with some book reviews that I have up my sleeve, um, as well as a few other surprises that I'll be springing on you this week. So... Come back and watch again sometime soon, and uh, I will talk to you then. Thanks. Bye.